Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Vox University. We are in week six of our somewhat non-sequential teaching series here. So we are going to be going a little bit backwards and we're going to pick up another lesson of words building worlds. If you didn't know, that was week two. We talked about the importance of understanding being created in the image of God and what that means to us as theologians, as all Christians are theologians, as we all have ideas and doctrines and theologies about particular things in the Christian faith. We all have these preset notions, but the danger is when we do not check our assumptions. We do not better understand the things that we presume to know. And so we're all theologians, just sometimes we're not very good at the theology part, but we're really good at the Christian part. And so one of the things we're wanting to do is address certain topics of theology just to give us some food for thought, something to mull over. That way when we speak to one another, and if you want to check out better ways to speak and how we think and our hearts and our, our actions and words, check out uh, two other weeks of Vox University. That would be week three and four of the logical fallacies that are often used. But today we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite word, right? I'm going to write this word on the board and no one's going to feel a lurch. No one's going to feel a pullback at all. Um, it's something that everybody really likes to talk about. Um, and that's sin, right? No, nobody's feeling uncomfortable yet. No, nobody's feeling comfortable. All right, good. Um, but, but sin is a very real thing. And it's something as Christians that has caused a lot of hurt, both from the act of sin, but also our bad theology about sin. And oftentimes we use sin and we weaponize it against other people, and there's a lot of guilt and there's a lot of shame. And as Christians, we oftentimes don't do a good job understanding sin in our minds and in our hearts, and therefore the way that we think and in the way that we speak and in the way that we act about sin towards ourselves or others can be very destructive. And so today I want to address one, just one, um, bad theology about sin, something that I think is important to address about sin. But to understand it correctly, we need to go back into history a little bit. You might have expected that we are going to go here, but that's all right. We're going to keep on going there anyway. And that is to understand something, um, particularly about war, right? War is a horrible thing. Many people will point like war is like the ultimate sin. Like no good things happen during warfare. It's the taking of life. It's the pushing of boundaries. Much of humans' brokenness is put under a magnifying glass during warfare. And we can point to war and be like, yeah, war is sin. War is a result of sin. War causes sin. Like war is not a good thing, right? Hopefully we can all agree with that. But here, here's an oftentimes kind of dismissed thing. Um, particularly here in America, is the after effects of war. And all that happens after war is oftentimes just as sinful as what happens inside of it. And nothing changes how we view sin like war. And it's this weird thing that we can draw direct understandings, or better word, of misunderstandings of theology tied to wars. Wars always breed and produce bad theology every single time. It's an irrefutable fact of human history. And in America, and there was one war in particular that bred a very bad understanding of sin, and that was World War I. World War I changed the world and how everyone viewed warfare and how everyone viewed um, pretty much humanity and everything in general. It, it's why we call it World War or the Great War. Like It, it, it completely radicalized thinking. But more than that, it radicalized warfare. There was new weapons, new ways of warfare being used and experimented on that had the likes of which had never been seen. And because of this, people were coming home from doing these acts and were having to learn how to live with it. And so the American church tried their best to ease the conscience of their soldiers by preaching a very bad view of sin. And the, the, the thought that was preached and wrote about and kind of invented during this early 1900s in America is that all sins are equal. This is not what is presented in the Bible. Rather, this is a theological response to the effects of World War I. And you might be thinking, but wait, I've heard all sins are equal. Well, of course we have, because in the early 70, or 1900s, that's what was taught in America, and it was never refuted publicly. And so you might be thinking like, hey, I know in the Bible it talks about how all sins are equal. So we're going to talk about those three verses real quick. Let's put those up here. Um, the first one that you've probably heard is in Matthew, right? Um, 
on the Sermon of, on the Mount, right? We, we've all heard this where Jesus is like, you know, if you have sin in your, or if you have hate in your heart, it's the same as killing someone. If you have adultery with your eyes or in your heart, it's the same as committing adultery with your body. And this is the first thing that we're going to point to of all sins being equal because the thinking of sins is the same as committing sins. And if you think that, that's because that's the number one verse that was used in this core theology of sin that all sins are equal. But then it gets even deeper um, because in Romans... Um, Paul writes that all sin uh, breeds death and that the wages of all sin is death. It's not just little sins, it's not just big sins, it's all sins. The wage is death. And it's like, well, then that must mean all sins are equal. But then it gets even further in the book of James. Um, and you'll notice I'm not writing the exact reference on here. That's because I don't want to accidentally lie to you and you look it up and be like, why does this verse about loving your neighbor have anything to do with it? Well, uh, if you want to get the more direct ones, please shoot that question. I'll try to answer it in the comments below. And as always, when we're talking about this, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below. This is a pre-recording. It's like Tuesday morning for me, maybe Thursday afternoon for y'all or whenever you guys are choosing to watch this. Um, so we don't have our live feed going where I can answer questions. But if you do have questions, please, please put them in the comments below and we can address them next week. Um, but in the book of James, uh, James writes about how if you break one law, then you're likely guilty of breaking all the laws because the laws are one. And so these three verses are used as a response to all sins are equal because clearly these three verses, particularly Jesus is like the number one. Um, why would he lie to us about this? Well, let's, let's look at the Bible a little bit bigger. Let, let's view a larger scope of the Bible instead of picking out verses that might support our idea. So if we go to the other side, right, I'm going to do a little bit of a counter thing. Um, the entirety of the law contradicts this idea, um, particularly uh, Numbers, the end of Exodus, and Leviticus. I'm just going to put those in parentheses like that. Um, the law hinges on the idea that different uh, infractions against God, yourself, or man call for greater restitutions. And so different sins are different because we have to go through different hoops, if you will, for forgiveness. And certain sins are greater. If, if the, the law is clear. If you intentionally murdered someone, that is different than if you accidentally committed manslaughter. Those are handled in very different ways. But you might be thinking, but Levi, we're Christians. We're not going to use the law. All right, all right, let's, let's keep on going. Um, instead, we have the entirety um, of the wisdom literature. Um, in the wisdom literature, particularly in Psalms and Proverbs, um, many times the authors will write out like, oh, these are three things that um, are bad. These are four things that are detestable. And they use language comparatively saying, these are bad, these are worse when talking about sins or the things that anger God. And you might be thinking, yeah, but that's poetry. Not a big deal. Let's keep going. All right, let's keep on going. Um, more people who preach that sins need to be handled differently are the prophets, um, particularly in the book of Ezekiel. Um, and Ezekiel particularly writes about when he's talking about the sins of Israel, he says things like, this is detestable that you did. This is much more detestable. And this is even more detestable. And the prophets use this stacking language of being like, you broke these laws and you really shouldn't have. But then you gone done did this, and you really shouldn't have done that. But then you did this, and my goodness, you messed up, because you never break this one thing. Now you might be thinking, but Levi, that's the Old Testament. Surely the New Testament has nothing to say to that. Well, let's keep on reading. Um, in the book of Matthew specifically, ironically, because we're listing it over here, um, Jesus does things like talk about the greatest commands. Or he says, um, don't break the least of these commands. Or talks about, like, these commands need greater forgiveness, not just from man, but from God as well. And Jesus puts this hierarchy in terms when talking about sin and breaking the law. And you might be thinking, but Levi, surely if it's on both sides, we shouldn't use it. Okay, 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 let's keep on going. Uh, not only Matthew, but Paul writes about this a lot, particularly in the book of Romans, uh, Corinthians, Galatians, um, and more. Um, but he talks about, hey, when you as the church are doing these things, you should not do these things. 
but you really shouldn't do these things. And he puts in place a hierarchy of sins of don't do these, but really don't do these. And if you do these, not only is there greater consequences, but the people who you put in authority should have these things in line. They, they can do a couple of these things, but they can't do these things. There you guys go. But wait, there's more actually in the book of Hebrews. We just keep on going. And the book of James, um, the author of uh, multiple other books, write about certain people need to be more careful of the sins they commit because they will be judged more harshly, particularly teachers, which is why full circle, I'm not putting those direct things on there because I don't want to be held accountable to accidentally lying to you because I'm teaching and I don't want to do what these guys told me not to do. Um, but we talk about this. And so when we look at the evidence, we have like, a, we can pick out three verses, but when we look from the law all the way through, it is in a much greater support of different sins need to be handled differently. Not all sins are equal. That being said, all sins separate us from God, our true selves, and relation with man. The, the, this teaching isn't to say some sins are okay to commit, others aren't. All sins are bad to commit, but we need to understand that we've been fed this idea that all sins are equal. And that's not what they are. And because of that, our theology and how we view people that we dub sinners is much harsher than what it really is. And we need to understand sin better. And so my goal today, I'm going to erase this. If anybody's taking notes, I'm going to give you a couple more moments. Um, my, my goal is to break down sin. We're going to break it down into three major categories to understand. In each one of these categories, there's going to be some subcategories. Um, of levels and degrees of sins. Now, we're not going to be calling like specific sins greater or worse, but we're going to be looking at sin in a general sense. All right, so here we go. Let's, let's dive into this. Let's erase these guys, and let's dive in. So our first category that we're going to be looking at, and let's do, let's do some black for this one. Um, our first category um, is called sins of acts. And this is what we um, Christians are really good at noticing because it's the easiest to notice. Sin as an act is the most obvious because we can point to it and say, well, that's sin, right? Everyone's tracking. And so we're going to be moving through these pretty quickly. And it's also the largest category because there are three subcategories of sin as an act. The first one is even further, the one that we really like to think about um, and that is sin as a choice, right? This is like the stereotypical, like there's a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, and we have to pick which one we're going to do, and we know it's sin. We know we shouldn't do it. We know that there may or may not be consequences if we're caught, but we choose to act in sin. It is a conscious choice that we know is wrong, but we choose to do it, and it's what we can point to the easiest. And so much of our understanding of sin and how we treat people who are sinners and how we treat ourselves who are sinners um, comes from exclusively picking this category of sin of choice. Because it's easy. It's easy to say, oh, you lied, you sinned. You went to a store and you stole, you did not pay. It's the easiest one to point to. So it's what we fixate on because in America, if you watch the previous Week three and four, we talked about moralism, and if you break this, then you are removed into the immoral category. Therefore, it's all wrong, and since you're all in that category, it's all equal, right? And in reality, like we talked about, it's a much more complex, much more real issue than just a harsh duality. Um, so not only is there sin of choice, the second subcategory here um, are sins of habits, um, or better called habitual sins. These are sins um, that we have become addicted to. And so our addictions manifest in this way. And so we oftentimes view choice and habits as the exact same. Well, not even Paul does this. Paul writes about how the things I wish to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. What a wretched man am I. The difference between these two categories, and this is a very important di difference, is habit sins. If you've talked to anyone who is addicted to a sin and they know it's wrong and they want to get over it and they're trying, if you've never uh, talked to someone who's in the process 
of AA or Celebrate Recovery or The Long Way, it is a very different conversation because they also do not like their sin. They do not picking like enjoying that sin. They don't pick that sin. It is deeply ingrained. It's a habit. It's an addiction. And what can become very uh, dangerous to us in the Christian community, if we do not understand this, we treat them much more harshly and just uh, enable a system of victim blaming and guilt shaming and that shouldn't be used for sins of habit. Because even Paul writes about what a wretched man and I. Paul doesn't want to commit these sins, but it's habitual. We can't help it. We're, we're stuck in it. The, the third category of sin as an act, and this one, um, my, there's so, always some fun examples, some silly examples, if you will, um, is sins of surprise, right? This is what, what often people call reactionary sins. This is you're at your friend's house, and your friend has a small child, and they're all being very careful about the word small child hears. And you're walking around the house, and you just slam your knee into the coffee table, and you say a word that should never be said around a small child, and small child hears it. And everybody's eyes get huge, and they all dart at you, and everybody knows that you gone done did messed up. Because by surprise, you have acted in sin. You knew it was wrong. You did not want to do it. You did not mean to do it. But sin nonetheless incurred. It is sins of surprise. And so it is a surprise because you're even surprised in yourself. Why did I do that thing? It's time to seek forgiveness for my sin of surprise. That was an act of sin. Everybody tracking, everybody understand. Hopefully even like right away, just viewing this one act or this category of acts of sin, you can be like, oh, shoot, these are very different. And I should be treating people differently. Someone who accidentally did something is not the same as someone who chose it or someone who is addicted to that thing. There are levels and degrees, and that's just one category. So let's let's continue. Let's pick out another color too. Let's do let's do some blue here. Um, but the next category of sin, instead of sin as an act, um, is going to be a fancy word. You guys can bring this word out at parties. You'll sound really smart. It's 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 great. Um, um, and it is called sins of infirmity. See that? You guys are all like, ooh, fancy words, Levi, you're so smart. And I, too, will pretend to be smart for a while. Um, but sins of infirmity. Um, infirmity is like a fancy word for being like, I wish I knew better, but I accidentally did it anyway. And this comes across um, in, in two major ways. Um, the first one um, is, and this is something that Rustin has talked about before, in fact, just recently in a sermon, um, and it's ignorance. It, it, it's not an intentional choice to sin. It's a, I didn't know it was sin, and I did it. I, I didn't know better. I, I didn't realize I was sinning. If I knew it was sin, I would not have done it, but I did it anyway. I didn't mean to, but I didn't know better. Um, it, it's a sin of ignorance. We don't, we don't know it's a sin until we've been taught well, which is why the ability to teach and understand, understand sin is important because when we teach things well, we can remove ignorance. And so an intentional act of getting rid of ignorance is also a way to remove sin from your life. The more that we can become educated about issues, the more that we can avoid accidentally committing sins of infirmity through our own ignorance. And so ignorance, like we talked about, is different than um, being surprised because you knew better. It's different than a habit. It's different than a choice because you genuinely didn't know. And so while you didn't know um, is important, it, it, it is still a sin. And it's something that we still need to get um, forgiveness for. It's something that, that is kind of a two-way street and why it's important to recognize that ignorance is also inherently sinful. It's not this level of sin, but it is still sinful because oftentimes people, myself included, when we're caught in a sin of infirmity of ignorance, will then try to act like there was no sin committed and that it's their problem for knowing better. I didn't know any better, and they should just accept that. When as Christians, we're called to a higher standard of living, and so when we accidentally commit sins of ignorance, there's still a necessary step of forgiveness in place for both God's self and forgiveness of man. Um, but not only ignorance, there, there's another level and layer to it. Um, and this is, man, I, I feel bad. I'm, I'm just going to try to keep it all 100 because I've done this all the time. I'm going to put it up here. 
Um, no, I don't. I don't mean to call anybody out, but here we go. Here we go. Um, I'm gonna call it a sin of means, um, and not that you are mean, but this is when you genuinely, in your heart of hearts, wanted to do something good. You thought you were making a good, wise choice. You thought you were being um, considerate to your spouse. You thought that you were being loving to your neighbor. You had the best intention of heart. You really thought, man, doing this thing will bring joy to God's self and others. Like, th this, is, this is the right choice to make, and you found out that your means were incorrect. You did not mean to sin, that's the mean as well. Um, you do not mean to sin, but your actions were still sinful. And, and we see this all the time, particularly in, in children. And, and with children, we're good at correcting it. But as we become adults, we think that we become better than it and the world needs to understand it. Right? It, it's um, a great silly example, but my friend was talking about recently how he was learning how to mow the yard. And he was mowing the yard, and he, he figured it out, and he's like, man, I'm really good at this, so I'm going to mow the yard before my mom and dad asks. I'm going to do it for them. And they're going to be really happy. And he was he was young, sixth, seventh grade. Got out there, started mowing, and just went straight through the garden, straight through the flower bed, straight through the mulch bed, and did it all. But was so proud, didn't even recognize that he had undone months of hard labors of his parents. Thought he was doing a great thing for his parents, and they came home and were furious. Because he had committed a sin of means. Now, that is different than if someone of malicious intent went out there and destroyed your flower bed. But you recognize when it happens to you that there is still a broken relationship. Just because someone had good intentions doesn't mean that it was a good action. There, there's a great phrase that I love um, of we judge others by their actions. We judge ourselves by our intentions. And if our intentions were good, we think that we did the right thing even when called out. But when it happens in reverse, we recognize that the brokenness of relationship, that can still happen through sins of means. We don't mean to commit uh, a bad thing to one another. We don't mean to do it. We have the best of heart. Mowing the yard before dad asks, that's so kind. If I hadn't destroyed the yard. But we do it nonetheless. And so learning to recognize in ourselves when we commit the sins of means, there's still a necessary step of forgiveness in place. And that to heal relationships, it means understanding sins of means. It also then calls back into the importance of teaching and understanding because it's impossible to commit or not commit sins of means if the expectations are not clear. And so for us, as we are in community, um, particularly many of you, as you are in community more than you ever thought you'd be in community with the people that you live with in the same house as you, and people are beginning to get on your nerves as constant quarantine and isolation tends to do, an inability to express our own emotions and expectations to other will naturally develop with sins of means. It, it's a natural fallout of poor communication and bad teaching and understanding of one another. That's what happens. But um, while there's three sins of acts, there was only two sins of infirmity, which you guys might recognize. We're actually doing a little bit of a countdown here. Oh, I wish green would show up better. Let's do red. We're going to do red. This will make it seem a little bit harsher because you're going to be like, well, it's directly connected, but it's like, eh, hold on a second. Um, uh, but red is sin as a state. Um, and what's nice about this is there's no subcategories. It just is. So I'm just going to write state down here. So everyone's like, oh, it's a state state. Um, and this is the idea of we sin not because we didn't know better, um, not because we did it by, but with an intention to do good, but oftentimes our natural resting state is not doing good. Um, the natural resting state of man is rarely uh, loving God, self better, and neighbors. Um, and so the sin of state most often comes up, this is my own uh, little definition for it, but I call it the happily married sins. Well, let me show you what I mean by that. It's, um, and and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to call anybody out, I'm just trying to keep it 100 because I do this all the time, I'm not calling anybody out. Here we go. Um, if my wife told me, hey, it's Tuesday, will you take the trash down in the morning because Tuesday is trash day? And I say, of course, dear, because I love you and I hate trash. I want it gone as much as you do. And Tuesday morning rolls around, and it's 9 o'clock, 
and all the garbage is sitting in the garbage cans and at the top of the driveway and not at the bottom of the driveway where I told my wife it would be. Now, did, did I choose? Did, did I say, well, forget you. I'm going to not collect the trash, even though I told you it. I'm going to lie to you and tell you I'll get the trash. No, I, I, I want the trash gone as much as she does. Um, do I have the means to do it? Yeah. Do I think I'm helping by leaving the trash there? No, I didn't mean to lie to you. I genuinely forgot. It was a mistake. I didn't mean to do it. I wish I could do it over, but here we are. It's sin as a state. We are naturally forgetful creatures. We can't trust our own memories. So we have to do things like weird, like put a pillow on the floor, like tie a knot around your finger to remember to do things. Because our natural state, if we are, if we stay the way we are, we will decline in relationships. It's an active choice to do better. So may, maybe that makes sense to you. But, but like I could talk about, it's, it's like the happily married sins. We don't mean to do it, but it, it's a genuine mistake of we forget. We, we meant to do it, but we didn't do it. And we said we would do it, and now there needs to be a, a moment of forgiveness because, it, once again, just like sins of means, when we put on the shoe and it happens to us and we say things like, can you pick up some of my favorite cereal on your way home from work? And they say, yes, absolutely I can. And they get home and there is no cereal. There's a broken sense of relationship. They meant to do it, but traffic was bad and they forgot. They got distracted. They didn't mean to not do it. They simply didn't do it. They, it, they, it, they lost awareness of it. So, so this is, this is our, our breakdown of sin. Now, why, why are we talking about that? Um, why are we talking about sin? It, it's a complicated issue to say the least. And what is and isn't sin is, is always difficult to understand at times. So why are, why are we breaking it down? We're breaking it down for a couple of things. Number one is to have better compassion on others, right? In, in America, we're taught so much that this is sin, um, this extreme sin of choice, and that if someone accidentally did it to you, well, they meant to do it. If they're addicted to it, well, it's because they chose it and it's their fault. Um, if, if they forgot, well, it's because they had malicious intent. When the truth is we need to recognize we're complex creatures. We, we are not black and white. We, we, we don't mean to sin. We, we think we do good and sometimes we even choose to do bad. But that doesn't mean that every person who hurts us or that we hurt is guilty of, of a sin of a choice. And so the, the goal of understanding sin is never to weaponize it against others, but to have greater compassion for neighbors. That, that we're, we all live in a state of sin. It, it's going to happen. We don't mean to, but, but it's going to. The other is to have better, better compassion on ourselves. But like understanding that like just because I'm, I'm addicted to this sin, just because I accidentally did this sin, just because I meant to do something good, just because I didn't know, I need to have a better sense of compassion on me. That harsh moralism, false dilemma paradigm is so deeply ingrained in us. We need to understand the importance of having compassion on ourselves because we have a God who already has compassion on us. What's great about, great about this chart is even though it's like a breakdown, if you will, some people might even be like, well, that's the worst. And getting down, it gets a little bit better. God has already forgiven all of this, right? God isn't saving like sins of choice and being like, this is something I can't forgive you from. God forgives all of this, and so we need to learn to understand and to forgive ourselves and have compassion on ourselves and others as God has already has compassion on us. Um, the third is to better like correct our own understanding and theology of sin, right? right that, that should always be the goal, is to challenge ourselves. If you've never thought about sin this way, I encourage you, be challenged by it. Spend some time thinking about it. Like, actually understand what, what might be presented here. Do some extra research. If you're like, no, that whole Matthew thing, I don't know about that. Go, go read it in its entirety. Don't, don't just cherry pick verses like people do when they desire to help people, but rather look at the holistic view of Scripture and apply that to people's lives. Um, the fourth is, fourth, we're ready for this? It was a fourth one. You guys didn't see it coming, but there was um, the fourth and final is when we understand one part of theology better, when, when we challenge ourselves to view one thing in a more complex and deeper light, it enables us to view the rest of our theology in a similar way. When we're willing to say this issue of sin is more complex than I gave it, issue, than I gave it credit for, it opens the door to accept other things as complex. But more than that, it, it should spark, I hope, um, it should spark questions in us. But by learning new things, we shouldn't be satisfied going, okay, well, now I understand sin, check plus. 
but rather how does this affect the rest of my theology? Um, and so like, I'll give a couple questions, and we're going to be talking a little bit about this next week, a little bit of a precursor. We're going to be doing some follow-up to this. Um, but like, Adam in the garden, did he ever commit sins of, of having a state of sin to Eve, or before the fruit, was he fully perfect? Jesus, did, did he ever, you know, if Mary told him clean his room, and he meant to clean his room, but he forgot... Is he guilty of this? It, it should change the way that we view our ideas of perfection. It should also challenge us as Christians. Of when we read things in the Bible, like be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, and those who are with Christ are without sin, well, what sins can we truly rid ourselves of? And, and so learning to understand the complexity of a verse, instead of just saying, this is the verse, let's beat my head with this Bible until I get it right, let, let's pause. Let's actually like understand and have a conversation of the genuine, genuine complexity that Scripture can sometimes present. So that's my challenge for us, is to lo love and have compassion on ourselves, love and have compassion on neighbors, understand complexity. All these things should help call us to understand God and self better. And as always, good theology is the study of God, and God is love. So if your theology is not causing you to love self, God, and others better and more, you need to double-check your theology. And that's what I'm hoping bringing up issues like this does. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll close, and I will catch you all live next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to be together, Lord. Lord, we pray as we study and open the doors to complex issues that we're able to accept them and grow with them, God. God, we pray uh, for your guidance as we navigate these waters, Lord. Please bless us on our journey to understand ourselves, to understand other humans, and to understand you better, Lord. Shane, that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much, and I will catch you all next Thursday. Have a great week.